Why did you choose this house? She was left outside a grocery store, the Happy Market. She left me right next to the newspapers. Who is abandoning newborns in paper bags, all in one square mile? And what do they have in common? Have you ever seen anything like no. this? It just blew my mind. Tonight, the news story that exploded. Both abandoned at birth. Into a national mystery and took 30 years to solve. I definitely want to get my fingers into that case. Our dogged detective. Wow. Connecting the dots and the DNA to discover their secret bond. Oh, give me a hug. These are so cute. <laughs> you guys weren't letting go. 2020 is there every step of the way as they search for answers, good news or bad. Who did this? Do you think you I, can handle it? I can handle it. I just, this breaks my heart. And the final twist no one sees coming. The three babies have grown up and are finding each other and are going to find you. Since the day I was born. Good evening, I'm Elizabeth Vargas. David is on assignment. As so many of you get ready for Mother's Day this weekend, here's a different way of looking at it, from foundlings. A foundling is an abandoned baby found and cared for by others. Well, tonight you're going to meet three of them. Their case is unconnected, or so we thought, until we spent nearly a year working with them. All the twists and turns and an ending that's almost impossible to believe. Tonight, a Mother's Day mystery that began with a baby's cry. I think if it was Saturday morning, I ran around the corner to get some milk. A last minute bike ride at dawn. 26 year old mother of two, Joanne Hauser, runs out to grab milk for that morning's breakfast. I went by the same way I usually go. And I thought I heard something like a cat. She detours from her morning errands, noticing a paper bag next to a dumpster. She moves in for a closer look. So I went over and I looked into this bag and there was a baby in the bag. A baby, astonishingly naked with the umbilical cord still attached, wrapped only in a towel, someone had left her there. No note, no identification, nothing. I picked up the bag and I rode back lickety-split to my house and I dialed 911. The local television station, KABC, captures this video of baby Jane Doe, a newborn just hours old, in an incubator at the hospital. Where the nurses hang a sign on her cradle, I know I'm somebody. The local newspaper hails the woman on the bicycle as an angel of mercy. Joanne, the Good Samaritan, stops by the hospital every day for a week, checking up on the beautiful abandoned baby. She looked like a little doll, a little tiny doll, just perfect. The nurses nicknamed the baby Lady Diana, after the princess who got married as the world watched four days earlier. And so London now sees for the first time. It was 1981. Foreigners Urgent was tearing up the charts. Big hair and big money became emblematic of the go-go 80s. Greed was good. But there are no gilded mansions in this unassuming working class community of Lawndale, California, clustered in the shadow of Los Angeles, where liquor stores dot the thoroughfares and Hawthorne Boulevard, where baby Doe was found, held a gritty distinction back then. What's its reputation? Prostitution. C.C. Moore is a genetic genealogist whose specialty is foundlings, the name for abandoned babies. Initially, I thought perhaps the mother was a prostitute that was working on Hawthorne Boulevard and really didn't have a lot of options. No options because in 1981 there were no safe haven laws which allow parents to hand over a baby to law enforcement or hospitals, no questions asked. So who abandoned that baby? One of those call girls? Or was it a teenager from the local high school just down the street? No one ever claims Lawndale's baby doe. Fast forward 34 years, that baby is now all grown up. You take this one, Anna. 
Janet Barnicote lives north of Los Angeles, about 100 miles from where she was found. This is my dad. After a year in foster care, Janet got lucky. She was adopted. Um, tell me about your adoptive parents. They found out they couldn't have children, so uh, they started to do the adoption process. Janet has an idyllic childhood, boisterous birthday parties, dance lessons, and even her own pony named Crocodile Dundee. Around the time Janet entered junior high school, she started to pepper her parents with questions about her past. Do I have siblings? Who are my parents? Why was I adopted? Why didn't they want me? The Barnacote sat her down for a candid conversation. I just remember sitting at the kitchen table and they had pulled out the newspaper articles about the lady who found me riding her bike. And Janet always knew she was adopted, but when she found out she was abandoned, she was shaken to the core. I got really mad and angry and I held on to that for quite a long time. And mad and angry at? At my birth mother for, you know, felt like she tossed me away. It was tearing me up inside and I didn't, couldn't handle that anymore. And then you're gonna go, gee, rest. Janet is now mother to her five children. Once upon a time, and once having my own children, you figure out what that natural true love is and I just couldn't understand how she didn't have that for me. Because Janet is a foundling, she has no identifying information, no medical records, no birth certificate. It's a total blank slate. As far as identity, there's no history, there's no roots. Desperate for any clues, Janet turned to that 34-year-old newspaper article and comes up with a name. That good Samaritan who found her in the paper bag, Joanne Hauser. She was my last connection to my birth mother. She uploaded a picture of herself holding a sign looking for that woman on the bike. I'm so excited! Hi! Hi. Oh, and that God. led to this emotional, heartfelt reunion with her guardian angel in 2013, all captured on video by a friend. She told me that I wasn't crying, more of like a whimper and... I imagine you also must have thanked her that day. Oh, I did, yes. She could have just kept going mm -hmm. and I wouldn't be sitting here today. They became Facebook friends and agreed to stay in touch. But in terms of Janet's family tree, Joanne is a dead end, offering no clues about Janet's mysterious abandonment. The only other way that they can learn about their heritage and their birth families is DNA. She sends a saliva sample to Ancestry.com and almost immediately Baby Doe hits pay dirt, a notification she has a match. I was like, what? Wait a minute. But not just any match, a match on her maternal side. It's a brother sharing the same mother. His name, Dean Hundorf. Elated, Janet looks him up on Facebook and staring back at her is a mirror image of herself. And I was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> it's a boy version of me. <laughs> well, that must have been a thunderbolt. I mean, to think all your life, I will never know anything about my biological family. Now, boom. It was amazing. It was so great. When we come back, what's the bombshell about that brother's past that could be the biggest clue yet? It's an extraordinary thing for a mother to abandon one baby but to abandon two. Stay with us. It is Christmas time, 1986, in Lawndale, California. The town doesn't know it yet, but someone is abandoning newborn babies. Here on 149th Street, a completely different nativity scene. No manger, just a doorstep. No swaddling clothes for this baby. In fact, in this 47 degree weather, no clothes at all. Just a brown paper bag. And I brought the dog out. When Danny Huerta takes his dog for a late night walk, he stumbles on a package left on his doorstep. My foot hit something right here and I reached down and it was a bag and I picked it up and it felt heavy. You know, something's in here. And there was a baby in there, baby boy. 
Just like Janet Barnacote, this baby boy is only hours old. The umbilical cord still attached, also left in a paper bag. Huerta's house is just more than a mile away from the alley where Janet Barnacote was found as a baby five years earlier. Once again, a local news crew captures the footage of Deputy Timothy Kane arriving on the scene, carrying the little bundle to a nearby hospital. 29 years later, he remembers it like it was yesterday. It was extremely dark that night. It was cold. He appeared to be two to three hours old. You know, it's just a young baby and, you know, nobody there to take care of it. And you wonder how somebody could leave a, a baby in a bag. Flash forward 29 years. Oh, wow, look at it. There it goes. That baby is a grown up father <laughs> with his own baby boy. Peekaboo. Dean Hundorf lives with his wife, Adrian, in Wisconsin. He's the long lost brother Janet has found through DNA. Like his sister, Dean was also adopted by a loving family. Lots of kids who are adopted grow up with lots of questions. Absolutely. What were yours? I can remember one major thing that sticks out in my mind, what my ethnicity was. I was a big kid growing up, so I, my friends thought, you know, maybe I was Samoan or, you know, something like that. Trips to the beach, happy Christmas mornings, Little League games. Dean had a childhood to be envied, but nevertheless, he felt incomplete. I always was wondering where I came from, who my parents were. And, you know, I, I maybe tried to push it aside just to forget about it, but, you know, it was always there. When Janet and Dean begin to compare notes online, they realize not only are they both adoptees, but unbelievably, they discover they were both abandoned by the same mother. I said, yeah, I was abandoned as, at birth and I don't have any information about any of my family. And then that's when she said, well, you know, the same thing had happened to her. I imagine she did the same thing I did and was like, whoa, what's going on? A DNA detective for 16 years, genealogist Cece Moore, says the story of Janet and Dean may be a first. At that point, I had never seen it before. It's an extraordinary thing for a mother to abandon one baby, but to abandon two. Yeah, it's hard to imagine what her circumstances must have been. Dean flies 2,000 miles to Los Angeles to meet Janet for the first time. It is so extraordinary for two foundlings to be related and then find each other. The local news is there to cover it. Oh my God, I love you. What was that like to put your arms around your sister for the first time in your life? It was like we had known each other forever and there was never, like we never skipped a beat. It was a brother hug. I love you. Oh my God. Once again, Janet's on Facebook, celebrating the new bond forged by blood. But that vexing question remains, what kind of mother abandons not one, but two babies, just five years apart and a mile away from each other? In a case like this that's really unique, I definitely want to get my fingers into that case and try to do some detective work to see what I can find. Meanwhile, Dean is doing some detective work of his own. Just like Janet, Dean feels the need to go back to the people who found him. He lands on that doorstep once again, where he was orphaned. And there, another lucky break. I'm Danny. Danny. Hi. Hello. I'm Dean. The same family still lives there. Come on in. <laughs> it's good to see you. <laughs> As he did 29 years ago on this stoop, Danny Huerta takes Dean into his arms. Danny also spent the last three decades wondering what happened to that baby. This is the baby you and dad found. Inside, Dean is introduced to Danny's family. I always wondered, Thank you so much. Wondered, where's that baby you found? <laughs> and I just can't wait to keep him. I just no honey. I had a good life, but just recently I wanted to, you know, get some answers. And in his honor, they have a warm surprise. We thought about you all your birthdays. We didn't forget. But as meaningful as it is to reconnect with the people from his past, none of them can provide any clues to Dean to how or why or who abandoned him at birth. Once again, Janet and Dean have hit a brick wall. The hunt for the biological mother became the priority. How did you help them? make their first breakthrough. So when I work with people of unknown parentage, one of the most important things is that they utilize all the resources. 
Cece knows finding their birth mother is a long shot. She believes the only way they might do it is to widen the DNA net. So in addition to Ancestry.com, she adds their DNA to databases 23andMe and Family Tree DNA. That widens our pool from about a million people to about two and a half million. We call it fishing in three ponds. And sure enough, they get a bite. Wow. Only not the bite they were expecting. I saw that they had another really close match. It's yet another sibling, a sister neither of them knew they had. <laughs> and I was like, holy cow, <laughs> are you serious? Surely this sister has answers. She must know who their mother is. No one abandons three babies, or do they? When I saw that in the middle of the night, I just was knocked off my chair. I mean, literally. The wheels instantly started turning. What's going on here? Stay with us. Twenty continues with Since the Day I Was Born. DNA detective Cece Moore has been up all night. She can't get out of her head the notion that someone has been abandoning babies. She's determined to help those two now grown up half siblings, Janet and Dean, find their mystery birth mother. And at 2 a.m., she strikes gold a DNA match to yet a third sibling. But all she's got to go on is the woman's date of birth. So I went into the California Birth Index, put her date of birth, and someone came up. Her name was Julie Christine Doe. That's what they use for a foundling. What went through your head? Oh, I could not believe it. We had two foundlings, now we have three foundlings. Two is shocking enough. Three is unprecedented. Although they had different fathers, all three shared the same mother. Who is she? Did she do this by herself? Why would she abandon them? Cece's research culling old newspapers reveals a familiar refrain. A baby, hours old, umbilical cord still attached, wrapped in a towel. So Julie was left at the Happy Market. It's a nice name. Yeah, if you had to be left somewhere. It was in the wee hours of a January morning in 1985. This time, a delivery man dropping off the morning newspapers discovers a baby wearing a blue jumpsuit. But the mystery remains. Who, during the 80s, would get pregnant three times, give birth three times, and then put the baby in a sack and drop it for someone to find? I've always known I was adopted. Julie Hutchison, like the others, would be adopted into a loving home. Birthday cakes, kittens, and petting zoos punctuated her childhood. Fast forward, she's now 31, working as an artist, living in Baltimore. How old were you when your parents got you? I was a newborn, just a couple days. They're amazing parents? I don't think I would have, you know, come as far in life as I have, mm -hmm. you know, without parents like them to guide me, to push me. 2020 brings Julie 2,600 miles from Baltimore to Los Angeles to meet her biological brother and sister. This is a big thing. I hope she has our same laugh. I just want to know, like, how was their life growing up adopted? Oh, there she is. OK. We're nervous. This is it. OK, I might <laughs> cry. <laughs> oh, give me a hug. It is an embrace that none of them ever dreamed they would share. The connection oh is God. immediate. Nice. <laughs> oh, we have the same laugh. Oh yes. <laughs> Three peas in a pod. They had the same sense of humor. They were cracking each other up. There is something about biological and genetic bonds that survives any sort of separation. With 2020 in tow, they hop in the car, retracing the locations where they were left. Would there be a pattern that could give them any clues? I'm thinking, you know, why out of all places? I mean, for Dean, a random house on a residential street. I guess it seems kind of busy, so maybe she thought, you know, people would see me right away. And Just a short two-minute walk down this Lawndale block to where Julie was found. She must have cared a little bit because she left me where the delivery guy would find me. Finally, Janet sees the alley where she was left next to a dumpster. Kind of creepy. Yeah. yeah. It is. It's yeah. kind of eerie. 
As they travel, something does become crystal clear. With each of these locations only within a mile of each other, the mother most likely lives here. Could she be one of the neighbors? Is she peering out from behind the curtains in one of these houses? Lots of questions that we'll get the answers to. I'm not going to let this dumpster define who I am. But for all the brick walls they're hitting, C.C. Moore's DNA analysis is about to knock one down. There is another close DNA match to all three kids. We got very lucky. We found a first cousin. A first cousin on their mother's side. His name is Adrian. And here is where it gets interesting. Because C.C. looks Adrian up on Facebook. And there, she is stunned. As she scrolls down Adrian's list of friends, a name this patchwork family already knows well. Joanne Hauser. Remember her? There was a baby in the bag. That good Samaritan who found Janet while riding her bike. It is an extraordinary coincidence that the woman who discovered Janet as a baby is yeah. friends yes. with Janet's biological cousin. Right, so when I first looked at it, I thought, why are they friends? But if you do family searches as long as C.C. Moore has, you will know that there are far fewer coincidences than deeply buried secrets. She immediately begins to build out Adrian's family tree and finds that Adrian's mother has two sisters and Joanne is one of them, making Joanne either the sibling's aunt or even more shocking, their mother. It's the conversation Cece never thought she would have with these three foundlings. For an already fractured family, this news may shatter them. All three of you have a first cousin match named Adrian. Adrian's mom and your mom are sisters. Now, uh, his mother has two full sibling sisters. And so Joanne is one of them. Wow. So the woman that found you is either your mother or your aunt. It takes a moment for the reality to sink in, especially for Janet. Then, an enormous sense of betrayal. Joanne either gave birth to them or her sister did, and she helped her cover it up. Either way, she was withholding vital information when she met Janet in 2013. I've met her. I sat in her house. Hi! Hi. Oh. Hugged her. It's my heart. I'm so sorry. That we all had to go through, you know, all this. Just the fact I sat in her house is what's eating me alive. Like, Janet is do. furious and wants to confront Joanne. What? She has agreed um, to see us today. Wow. <gasps> yeah. Are you guys ready for this? I, I, yeah, I want some answers. A doorstep, a grocery store, a dumpster. Who left them there, their aunt or their mother? After a long, arduous journey, the truth is now just one step away. Not six degrees of separation, we're down to one. <laughs> Stay with us. We are going to go in and talk to Joanne, the lady who found me. See if she can lead us in any direction. Joanne Hauser's moment of reckoning has arrived. The so-called Good Samaritan, who said she rescued baby Janet from an alleyway, is being paid a visit. Three siblings, Janet, Dean, and Julie, are on their way over for a 6.30 meeting. As cliche as it sounds, it is a date with destiny. You must have been nervous as heck. I was scared, I was nervous. I was still, I think, a little angry. But I knew that we'd come this far. We might as well just keep going until the wheels fall off. Tense, nervous, Janet decides she should go in first. Okay. As you walked up to her doorstep that day, what's going on in your head? All I kept telling myself was, just please let her tell the truth. C.C. Moore goes with her. Oh. Janet is finally sitting at the table with the woman who may have the answers to a lifetime of questions. Cece is thankfully there to break the ice. I've been working with Janet. There was a man named Adrian, your sister's son. Yeah. And he came out as Janet and Dean and Julie's first cousin. Oh, yeah. 
So that leads us back to you. Yeah. After more than three decades of harboring a dark secret, Joanne can hold it in no longer. Well, okay, I'll ha I have something to say. I, today I decided I better come clean. But I've been living with the guilt for so long. It's just a secret I've been carrying all these years, you know? And it's probably mind boggling, but yeah, I did give birth to you. I know it. Yeah. I just want you to know I'm not I'm mad so at you. sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm not mad at This you. is a monumental um, thing. Finally, the truth. A 34-year-old mystery is solved. Joanne wasn't her guardian angel. Joanne is her birth mother. And I know this has impacted your life and the life of It has, other two. but I forgive you. I'm so I really sorry. do. I forgive you. How can you forgive me, though? I mean, it's killing me because I abandoned you guys, you know? You know what? Foundlings, people that were abandoned, mm -hmm. what I have found is they're the most forgiving, loving people I've ever known. I'm not exaggerating. I was supposed you would have to be, huh? But we, we, want, we want you to know we're not mad at you. We love you. And when she finally came clean, I could feel, like, her burden. I could feel it, and I could see it, and... I, I just couldn't be mad at her. All that anger just disappeared? It did. I hated you. Not you, but I hated you. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I can't, I can't anymore. I Janet asks about that story that's come to define her whole life. Please tell me I wasn't in an alley. No, you weren't. Oh, thank God. No, <laughs> no, I just made the call and they came and I just made up a story. So Janet was never abandoned in an alley. It was all a ruse. But what about Julie and Dean? They're about to come face to face with their histories as well. They are here and they want to meet you. Where are they? Outside. Moments later, Dean and Julie appear at the door. Come, 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 come. So this is Julie. Hey. Julie, hi. The two children Joanne has not seen since they were born and this is Dean. Dean, oh my God. Are reunited yeah. with their birth mother. As soon as I walked in there, my heart broke for her. Why? This is a woman who's been through so much. Like I said, you know, I can't hate her. I just want you to know that I do love you. Yeah. Dean. Yeah. We all do. He's, he's the quiet one. <laughs> for Dean, forgiveness comes hard. She just looked like a stranger to me. You know, I, she didn't look... There was no flicker of recognition? No. Not like you had with your own sister? No. I can't imagine it's been... I mean, you've ever forgotten about us, right? Never. I mean, never. Harboring a secret has clearly taken a toll. They're about to learn just how big. It's been killing me this, all this time, and it's killing me now. No. It is not a figure of speech. Joanne recently suffered both a heart attack and a stroke. The timing was significant. It happened just as Janet, Dean, and Julie's odyssey was playing out on Facebook. And Joanne, a Facebook friend, was watching it all. Joanne watched Janet find Dean and then watched her find Julie. Can you imagine if you were Joanne, how you must have been feeling? I would think terrified might be yes. one of the things because at this point the three babies you abandoned have grown up and are finding each other and are gonna find you it's like all over facebook and everything it's gonna we, it's really killing me i have to have open heart surgery within a few weeks oh no yeah. the whole process from her meeting me to us finding julie i think it just it it really did a toll on her. Miraculously, they've met their birth mother after endless searching, only to realize their time with her may be limited. What were the most important questions you needed her to answer? Does she love us? You loved us. Yes. yes. And I'm sure that I still was... do. Yeah. She said, oh, God, yes. I still As... do. I'm so sorry. You're okay. Come here, come here. When we come back, for the first time, the woman with a lifetime of secrets opens up to 2020. Why did she do this? How did she do this? Did she have help? Tell me what you were thinking. You're asking me these questions, and I would like to know the answer myself. Stay with us. Three children have come to a home, a house they never grew up in, and to a mother they've never met. 
It was so tense that when the meeting was over, they are giddy with relief. But for Joanne Hauser, there is no relief, just shame. Weighed down by the secret she alone knew about and never spoke about until now. There are people who hear this and can sort of wrap their heads around. Well, yeah, and that's why I didn't, doing it once. Yeah, but three, three times, times. Right. I didn't want to do this because I would be here with you and I would be on TV and everybody's gonna know. <sighs> Joanne came of age in the 60s. She dropped out of college and embraced the L.A. party scene. We were partying all the time, smoking pot and drinking. At 22, Joanne marries and has two boys, but the marriage quickly crumbles. Joanne divorces and falls back into her partying ways. And it was at one of those parties, fueled by drugs and alcohol, that Janet is conceived. Joanne, broke, single, unemployed, keeps the pregnancy a secret. How did you hide it, Joanne? I mean, how well, did you... Well, I'm big. I mean, look at me. You know? Nobody ever said, hey, you're looking a little... You're looking a little heavy there. No, no. Joanne would not tell a soul. Nine months later, in the early hours of an August morning, she goes into labor, alone in her house, with her two older boys sleeping in the next room. So what happened when you went into labor? Were you afraid? I was terrified. I remember it was around four o'clock in the morning and I did it by myself. You know, I laid there and went through the labor and then went into the bathroom in the tub and drew the warm water and laid in the warm water and that helped. The reality Joanne never wanted to face is now staring back at her in the form of a new baby girl, four pounds, one ounce. I'm like, what, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Feeling ill-equipped to care for any more children, a desperate Joanne hatches that outlandish scheme, pretending she's found a baby by a dumpster, playing Good Samaritan to the police. I remember this young guy would call me and call me a hero. I'm not a hero. If they only knew the real story. Yeah, I'm not a hero. You went to visit Janet every day for that yes. first week of her mm -hmm. life in the hospital. Why did you do that? because I wanted to see her. I was totally amazed. Yeah, she was perfect. Just tiny little thing. Just almost didn't want to give her up, you know? I felt if someone else had her, they could give her a better life than I could. Four years later, still single, she finds herself pregnant yet again. Why weren't you using birth control? Stupid, crazy not thinking. Julie, like Janet, would be born at home. The mother, with no medication, no help, cuts the umbilical cord herself. Julie was born on one of your son's birthday. Yeah, January 19th, yeah, my oldest son. After you left her at the Happy Mart, Yeah. you came back and threw a birthday party. Yeah, I did, yeah. How did you do that? That was tough because I was not feeling too great after I had her. Photos from that day capture a pale Joanne, smiling through the pain of just giving birth and then abandoning her second child. What was going through your mind as you're celebrating the birthday of one child, having just given birth to another child and left it behind a store. You know, I felt like I was the biggest hypocrite in the world, you know. And shockingly, it wouldn't be the last time. The very next year, Joanne is pregnant again with Dean. For the third time, she endures labor alone, delivers a son alone, and cleans up alone. I remember driving around with him in the car. It's like, what can I do? What am I going to do? So I knew the first time he cried, they would probably open their door and find him right there, you know? An inconceivable act to do once, let alone three times. How much did you think about these three children? All the time, every day. And then one day in 2013, you find out Janet is yeah. looking for you. Yeah. Were you excited? Yeah, I was. You thought, I'm going to see my daughter. I was thrilled. It was just like, oh my god, there she is. And she's a grown woman. Hi. Hi. Looking back, a closer examination of that reunion 
gives it a whole different meaning. Over and over, Joanne pulls Janet back to look at her face. Mm -hmm. When I look at it, I see someone who's very proud of Janet. It looks like more of a motherly proudness. Yet again, Joanne keeps her secret and passes up the opportunity to tell Janet the truth. Joanne, what is it like to live with that kind of guilt? Terrible. That kind of shame? I'm blown away at their, at their kindness. Their forgiveness. Their forgiveness, right. Have you forgiven yourself yet? I don't think I have. You know, everybody's encouraging me to, you know, forgive yourself, forgive yourself. Well, how do you do that? What, is there a formula for that? Is there? No? See? You just have to find your way there somehow because yeah. living in this yeah. doesn't work. It makes you sick. And now I'm facing, you know, major heart surgery in a, in a week. A mother filled with remorse, trying to reconcile with the very children she abandoned, now facing that dreaded operation. For the three siblings, could this be the last goodbye from their newfound birth mother? And still to come, a call few men ever want to get. You may be my father. Stay with us. It is five o'clock in the morning and I'm here at the hospital because my biological mom is having heart surgery. Did you get any sleep last night? A little bit. It is time to mend a mother's broken heart. Janet wonders if this hug is her last. I love you. I love you too. Just before she goes into surgery, Joanne has one last gift for her children. The names of the men who fathered them. Even if she made a lot of bad choices in the past, she's starting to make good choices now. There's never a phone call that someone is expecting to get. Normally I, I call him. CC coaches Janet through a phone call to the father, Kent. Okay. And after leaving a message, a call back. <gasps> oh, what do I do? Pick up, pick up. Hi Kent, how are you? Yes, you may be my father. I actually do know who my mother is. Her name is Joanne. Were you with a woman um, named Joanne in the 80s? Kent truthfully acknowledges that he was with Joanne back then, but says he is in shock. He's just trying to take it all in. I couldn't imagine what you would be going through with a phone call from someone random. Hey, I'm your daughter. <laughs> Aww. But then something unexpected. Choking back tears, he tells Janet he always wanted a little girl. Bye-bye. Oh, that broke my heart. <laughs> He's crying. <laughs> a few days later, father and daughter meet for the first time. Oh, it's so good to see you. I love you, too. I love you like my little girl. Little did Kent know, he's also a grandfather. Yeah, and Janet wasn't the only one who got to meet her birth father. <laughs> Julie meets her birth father, Bobby. Hi. Julie? Yes. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> wow, you do look like my mom. Who immediately takes out a photo of his mother.